thankful, uh, and that's a mature response to recognize when your own personal convictions have moved from personal to this should be for everyone, and what's wrong with you, why don't you do this? So uh, it's a very mature response to recognize your own shortcomings, so I appreciate the maturity in that. Grab your Bibles. Again, uh, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one of the seats in front of you. Also grab the CCO app. Uh, you can follow along there. We've got the card on there, the notes, fill in notes, all that stuff. Before we get into this study, I need to address something. Uh, I've, I've gotten a few comments, and I want to address them. Um, last week, I made mention of, or I, I referenced to a scripture in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. I'm going to read that scripture. We've all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment or filthy rags. When I mentioned that last week, I made the disgusting statement, and I'm being facetious, that that term means your righteousness is as a used menstrual rag. Some people found offense with that statement. Let me help you understand something. That is the Bible. Amen. If you're offended, you're offended by God, not by me. Amen. I will continue to preach the word of God. Amen. If you don't like it, this may not be the church for you. I love you. I want you to be solid in the word of God. But that word literally means a used menstrual rag. And the reason it's there is to give you the understanding of the complete depravity that your righteousness is. Amen. You have nothing to bring to God. You have nothing. So the contrast between that uncleanliness and the blood of Jesus, which saves us from our sins, the pure, holy blood of the spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that contrast should be shocking. That's right. Because that's your righteousness versus God's righteousness. Amen. So again, I'm just telling you, I love you. Whoever's up in arms and upset about this, I love you. But you're missing the point. You can't be, again, what it's telling me is you're more offended by my words than God's words. Right. Uh, don't, don't do that. Again, I'm the mailman, as I always like to say. Uh, I deliver the mail. If you don't like the mail, don't shoot the mailman. Okay? <laughs> Just delivering the mail. Okay? Take it up with the sender. That's God. I'll, I'll let you two deal with that. That's something that you need to deal with. Amen. Amen. Um, begin, I want to draw your mental attention to elementary school. Now, some of you are like, no, don't take me back there. <laughs> it's a tough time for some, I understand. If you remember in elementary school, we used to get on the playground during recess, and we used to play games. A lot of times, we'd have team sports or, you know, play soccer or football or whatever the team was. The two most popular kids, or the leaders, if you will, they would jump up and be the team captains. At that point, they would begin the selection process of the popular kids. If you were like me, you were in that group, so you were just hoping to get somewhere in the middle. When that didn't happen and you're the last guy left, they give you that also, just, it grates on my heart too. The defeated nod, all right, fine. You can be my team. <laughs> to which they would then tell you to stand over on the side and just don't move. <laughs> okay, I'm a little hurt, just FYI. But as we look at that, that's how, in a sense, those teams were picked. Teams were selected in those ways back in the day. We'd grab the athletic kid, we'd grab the popular kid, we'd want those guys to be on our team, because why? We want to win. Today we're going to look at the, the choosing of the team of the apostles and how God uses that team to do some amazing things and then what we can glean from that choice and those men. If you would, would you please stand with me as we give honor to the reading of God's word by standing again, only if you're able to stand. Luke chapter six, verses 12 through 19. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, which he named apostles. Simon, whom, Pete, to whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. 
verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him, and he healed them all. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it has the power to transform each and every one of us. Lord, I pray for softened hearts today, again, as we recognize how you choose your team and the, the, the people that you want on your team. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be in a place Lord, where we'd say, Lord, use me on your team. Use me for the work, for the furtherance of the gospel. Use me, Lord, as a disciple maker. Use me as one, Lord, who is called to serve in your kingdom. So, Lord, I pray for not hard hearts, but softened hearts. Lord, I pray that each and every one would hear your word and your Holy Spirit would just give that fullness in their heart. Lord, speak to us, Lord Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Church, you can be seated. We're going to get right into it. In those days, he went out onto the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer. Most likely, he was leaving Capernaum. It's kind of his home base at this point, and we've seen this. If you remember back a few weeks ago, I kind of did a map. Capernaum is located at the top part, the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And right around that region, if you come with me to Israel, you'll see this, but there's hills and plains and then more hills. It's not really mountainous per se. Uh, mountains are really further north towards Lebanon, but you actually have this, uh, you know, hills and plateaus and then more hills. And I mean, we're not talking snow-covered peaks. We're calling, you know, they're, they're hills. So he goes out to this mountain, this hill, this top part, and he begins to pray. And I want to point this out because it's always important to point out when Jesus prays. If it's important for Jesus, it should be important for you. And we call it this way. Verse 13, and when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. Now, before we go any further, I think it's always important. And again, I'm not going to get too in-depth, but we're, we're doing what's called the law of identity. Something is what we say it is. We're defining our terms. A lot of times this happens. We can go around talking to someone about something, thinking we're thinking the same thing. We really aren't thinking the same thing at all. This happens whenever, whenever I'm uh, sharing the gospel or Jesus with a Mormon. They'll nod a lot. Well, they'll come to me and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. I'll say, cool, which one? They're like, well, Jesus. I'm like, no, no, no. There's either the Jesus of the Bible or there's the Jesus of the Book of Mormon. Which one are you talking about? Because they're two different guys. So again, you could be talking Jesus. You could say the word Jesus a bunch, but who you say he is and who that person thinks he is are two different things. So let's define our terms. It says he called the disciples. He called his disciples. What is a disciple? The word disciple literally means learner. Someone who is learning. These were the guys who were always with Jesus, learning more and more about him. We as Christians, we spend our whole lives learning about the Lord whom we will someday meet face to face. It's someone who wants to spend their time gleaning and learning from Jesus. And every day, every week, every year, growing to look more and more like him. That's what a disciple is. And we see here from this scripture, verse 13, I'll, I'll read it again. And when the day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12. There's a common misconception that there was only 12 disciples. No, there was many more disciples. Could be hundreds. Because we saw it in the last few weeks. Every time Jesus went to the synagogue, many people came to listen to hear him teach. So there were those who were learning from Jesus. They were his disciples. They were following him, learning from him. And from those guys, he chooses 12. So this begs the question. He chooses these 12, calls them apostles. What's an apostle? Glad you asked. The word apostolos is the word used in Greek. It means someone who is sent out. Someone who is sent out. It can be used for an envoy. It can be used for an ambassador. Think about this. When you go abroad, when you go to different countries, there are embassies. You go to an embassy, that is a little slice of your home country in a foreign land. If you go to Europe, every European country has an American embassy. That American embassy is a slice of America in that other country. Such is the same for us. We are foreigners in this land. We are citizens of heaven here on earth for a time. We've been sent out into this world to do that which God has called us to do. 
We are a little slice of heaven here on earth. That's what we're called to be. So again, as ambassadors, we go to represent who we came from. We come to represent Christ. Christians are sent out to be ambassadors for Christ, but not just by our words, but more so by our actions. Then he says in verse 14, Simon, he lists the, the disciples, Simon, who he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who is called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. So we see here these 12 guys. And what I want to do is, like I said, I want to point out some things that we can glean from these guys and how Jesus chose them. If you're taking notes, it's a good place to start. Number one, pray before you make big decisions. Jesus spent all night in prayer. When was the last time you spent all minute in prayer? <laughs> Right? When was the last time you prayed for something hardcore that wasn't just a meal? Uh, you know what I mean? That you were praying didn't just turn into leafy green vegetables on the way down. Before you ate dessert, you're like, oh, Lord, please don't let this ruin my night's sleep. Right? When was the last time you prayed fervently? When was the last time you prayed all night? See, Jesus prayed long and hard. And what did he do? He toiled all night in prayer before doing what? Before choosing his guys. And you start to think, well, Jesus knew everything. He, he knew it all. Why, why, why didn't he just say, well, I already know the will of God. I'm here, you guys. He was demonstrating to us that he needed to know the will of the Father. We remember in the garden, he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In the sense, he's saying the same thing here. God, I've got my reasons. I've got my lists. I've got my pros and cons on that guy, but I need your wisdom, not my wisdom. We remember God was fully man, fully human, and fully God. We need to recognize that. Listen, you guys know how it goes. If you guys prayed for a decision, prayed for someone, prayed for a person, you're, you're praying about a decision, Lord, what should we do? Sometimes we've got to pray long and hard. And, and listen, I'm not looking for naturalistic. I'm looking for supernatural. I need wisdom. Listen, I can come up with a great list of why I should choose what I choose. Right? You can too. All right, let's sit down and think about this logically. I've got my pros and my cons, and it would all seem that it would point this direction. Right? Sometimes God's going, no, I want you to go in my direction. That's your direction. That's man's wisdom. We need God's wisdom. God's wisdom is supernatural. It's above our wisdom. Now listen, I'm not saying that I've toiled in prayer and then when I pray, I'm like, Lord, who is it? Who is it that you want for this ministry? All the lights dim and a guy glows. Like, that's never happened. Just FYI. You're like, well, pastors must have it easy. They just pray and people glow. No. <laughs> only people I've seen glow that work in nuclear plants. That's it. That's the only people. It's just like a faint glow. Just saying. But that's never happened. Sometimes God uses those times of toiling in prayer to set our hearts right. To get us so that those those supernatural decisions are very natural in his kingdom. As the, the Lord has um, shuffled some things around on staff in recent months, there haven't been overtly hard decisions. Pray, pray, and pray, and the Lord, as Ephesians tells us, he prepares our steps beforehand that we should walk in them. He makes the supernatural very natural. Some things that I couldn't have even fathomed, the Lord did by his own will and work. He went before us. He had it all set in motion. He was just saying, hey, just walk in it. It's a beautiful thing. We need to pray. Number two, if you are taking notes, and again, I think this was important too. And as I mentioned, sometimes we forget Jesus' humanity. So number two is Jesus needed friends too. Sometimes we miss the humanity aspect of Jesus, right? We think he's just the guy that floats around healing people. He's got a perpetual robe with flowy things, and he just walks around like this, right? You know, all the Catholic caricatures that we've seen of him. And that's what he does, and then he finds a place to disappear at night. He just kind of floats away into the ethos, and the next morning he appears. Oh, Jesus, where'd you go? He, he, that's not Jesus. That's not what he was. He was a man. He hung out with these guys. He wasn't just picking his apostles. He was picking his friends that he was going to spend the next three years of his life with. 
He was picking these guys. He knew that he needed some solid dudes. And listen, he picked a bunch of guys. These guys were going to have fun together. I almost guarantee you, although I can't prove it in scripture, I guarantee they played pull my finger at least once. <laughs> Just once. Maybe not. They, they didn't go any further than that, but there was some breaking wind and some laughter that happened, guaranteed, at least one time in the three years. And Jesus is probably all holy about it. Don't do that again. Or, you know, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how it went. But I think it happened. And I just think if 12 guys get together, this is what's going to happen. But again, they were friends. They laughed together. They cried together. They ministered together. They spent almost every waking moment together. So he was picking friends. Some of you guys need friends. Some of you guys, unfortunately, don't have a lot of friends. You have acquaintances. You don't have deep-rooted friendships. Some of you will leave here, you'll go home, you'll shut all the shades, you'll turn on Netflix until the next day. Until something else happens, something else that you need to be at. You don't have deep-rooted friendships. This is one of the reasons why it's so important for you to be involved in community in our home fellowships. You need to be involved with people who know you more than just the name or where you sit. Who know who you are, who you can drop off the things, the, the longings of your heart, the deep things that you need to be prayed for. Number three, and I think this is an important part and something that I've always said and is near and dear to my heart, we need to start with the men. Yeah. I've said this for a long time, and I still believe it even so probably more today, that aside from the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, one of the most important things that a church can do is reach the men. Because when you get the men, you get the families. When the men are doing what they're supposed to do, the families are falling in line doing what they're supposed to do. As we were talking about the dad's ministry, when a dad is doing his thing, the kids will be raised the right way. When a dad is doing his thing, when a husband is doing his thing, he'll be washing his wife in the water of the word. That's what happens. And then the family goes that direction. Listen, these guys, man, we need to start with these men. And, and that doesn't discount women. I don't want anybody to think I'm discounting women. As I taught even on Mother's Day, just how God used some great moms in the Bible. There's so many women that God has used. This isn't to discount a woman's role. This is to say that God has a plan. God has a hierarchy, the way that he has set things up in this earthly kingdom right now. And he has chosen men to lead families and households in his church. We need more men. Interestingly, I read a book the, about five years ago now. It was right as I was taking over the men's ministry, and it, it was a hard thing for me because as I was looking at our men's ministry, I was like, there's something missing. And so I read this book. It was entitled, Why Men Hate Going to Church. And so I started gleaning from this book, and I'll basically give you the synopsis so you don't have to read it. It was basically this. He went through the history of church in America from basically the early 1900s through when the book was written. And so what he was basically showing is the church was fine, and then we had several wars. So during the First World War, men were drafted. They were taken away from their homes and their home churches. They were sent off to a battlefield far away. And the church was left as a predominantly woman-based church. And so then they'd come back, and the church looked a little different, but they still went. Then World War II took place. More men left, went off to fight a war. The churches were left predominantly women. The ministers were ministering to predominantly women. Then you have in the 60s, Vietnam, same thing. Men gone, predominantly women churches. So that when men started coming back to churches, the church didn't look like the church that they remembered. It had become effeminate. And that's not a wrong thing, but when you're ministering to mostly women, a church is going to, by nature, become effeminate. This is when the doilies came out, right? This is when everything became flowery, and there was doilies on everything. There was doilies on chairs, there was doilies on podiums, there was doilies on the head, there was doilies everywhere. The whole church got doilies, right? And so a guy comes back, and he's like, what is this stuff, you know? Those are doilies. You're supposed to like them. And he was just like, ugh. The music became effeminate, too. The songs became a little bit more love songs to Jesus. And as a dude, as a guy, singing a love song to another guy, it was weird. That's what happened. And so the church became not a, not a ground for a man to be a man. It became more effeminate because of the culture of the church. And so again, the, the heart being men, it's okay to be men. But as a man, you need to lead effectively. And ladies, I want to say this to you. The wives in this house, you have a role in this too. Support your man. Amen. Love your man. Pray for your man. Don't, don't, don't tell him how stupid he is or what a terrible job he's doing. Did you hear Pastor Day? He was talking to you. You're dumb. 
You don't know what you're doing. You don't do any of this. What's wrong with you? Don't do that. You know what that does? That deflates a man. And guess what he doesn't want to do? Anything. Encourage him. Love on him. Pray for him. Seek that. Seek God's will in his life. The, the fervent prayer of a righteous woman avails much too. Pray for your husband. Pray that he would be the man that God has created him to be. Don't just tell him how lame he is. <laughs> Number four, if you're taking notes. This is one that I think is very important too. These were ordinary guys. These were ordinary men. They weren't wealthy. They weren't famous. They, went, they weren't influential. They weren't the guys that got picked first. They were guys that got picked last. They had no special education. They were just simply men of the common people. They had no pedigree. They had no letters after their last name. Tax collectors, sinners, and fishermen. A whole group of them. It's as if Jesus says, give me 12 ordinary men, and I'm going to change the world. Give me 12 guys who are sold out for me in my kingdom, and I will make them into world changers. It's the thing about the church. Listen, if you're ordinary, welcome. If you think, well, I'm actually pretty special. I'm extraordinary, then you have more. Then you're supposed to do more because God has called you to more because God has given you more. See, sometimes God uses just the ordinary. We see in Scripture that he uses the foolish to confound the wise. Why? Because he fills them with the Holy Spirit and uses them for his purpose. It confounds the wise because they say, what? He's not learning. He didn't have an education. But look at what God has done. That's who God uses. The work of Jesus is not in the hands of the people that the world would call great, but in the hands of ordinary people like you and me. See, sometimes we get caught up. Uh, the, the, the culture of the church becomes like the culture of the world. We're looking for the celebrity. You see this in the church, and I don't even know if these guys want it, but they become celebrity pastors. I don't want to be a celebrity. I don't want my name to be known. I want Jesus' name to be known. Right? Who cares who I am? I want to know who Jesus is. I don't care that you know my name when, when you leave here. I really don't. I want you to know who Jesus is. Because if you know who Jesus is, now you can be a world changer. If you know who I am, congratulations, you can find me on Facebook. Like, that's about it. That's about it. Again, who Jesus is is way more important than who I am or who you are. Number five, and this is where I want to camp for a little bit. This is what the Lord has given me this week specifically for us. Sometimes the team that God picks is not the team that you pick. It's so true. So often we, we look at the way God has set things up and we start throwing stones. God, I would not have done that. Well, you're not God. It proves a couple of things. Let's take two of these 12 that we're talking about. Matthew, he's a tax collector. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Tax collectors were in the same boat as robbers and murderers. That's a big, like, nasty boat that I don't want to be in. Robbers and murderers and tax collectors were all lumped together. So he was therefore a traitor and a renegade. Everyone hated him. Simon was a zealot. What's a zealot? A zealot was basically a fanatical nationalist. You know who the nationalists hated? Anybody who is Roman, especially tax collectors, they were sworn as a zealot to assassinate tax collectors of the Roman government. So Jesus is like, let's put them on the same team. <laughs> right? I mean, is he just wanting a fight? Like, does he pull them on the same team and then just kind of step back and be like, it'll be fun? <laughs> no, he puts them on the same team. And it's one of the miracles of those who are called in Christ. Matthew, a tax collector, and Simon the Zealot could live at peace in the close company of apostles. They became not just acquaintances, but friends. When people are really Christian, the most diverse and divergent types can live at peace together. The great Christian author G.K. Chesterton wrote this. It's only in Christ that we can solve the problem of living together. Because even people who are complete opposites may be united in their love for him. If we really love him, that is Jesus, we will also love one another. We have to love one another, church, even if you don't like it. Remember, Jesus died on the cross to change you. You need to change your heart. What does this mean for us practically? And I think there's a very practical point for our culture in our day and age to repair some of the things that have been going on in our culture, especially in the church. The church 
must, needs to reflect the community that the church is in. It must do so. Why? Well, think about it this way. If a church is too old, there's probably a lack of youth, and the church has become pharisaical in nature. When a church becomes too old and it's a sea of white hair, it's basically them saying, darn you people, you young people and all your rap music, where are the earplugs? It's, it's a group of people who yell at people for being on their lawn, right? When a church gets too old, they have not embraced newness. Conversely, if a church is too young, what they've done is they've pushed the old people out and said, you guys just need to get with the times. You need to figure it out. We're new, we're hip, we're happening, we're cool. You're not, you're old. See, if you come into a church that's either one of those, run away. I mean, if you're in a young church and it's on a college campus, I guess that's cool. If you go to a church at a retirement community, okay, and it's all old people, well, good, it reflects the community. If you go to a church in Oceanside and it's one or the other, they've missed the point. They're focusing on something different than the community of believers. If you go to a church that's too nationalistic, you've probably found a church that worships America but calls it Jesus. See, there's some churches that are like that. They'll wave the American flag, but they wave it like they worship it. I love America. Huh. Greatest country on God's planet. In the history of the world, this is the greatest country. I don't worship it. I don't worship the flag. I'm grateful for the men and women who defend our freedom for me to be able to say what I'm saying right now. Grateful for it. But what if America goes away? Is Jesus still good? Is God still good? Yeah, absolutely he's good. I don't even need to say that he's good. He's good whether or not I say it or not. He's good whether I affirm it or not. God is good even if America is not here. Some people need to be careful that they don't worship America over Jesus. It goes the same for a black church or a white church or a Hispanic church or a Samoan or Filipino or Asian. See, it's, it's one thing if you walk into a church that's full of Korean people, a Korean church. You walk into that church, wow, there's a lot of Koreans here. Well, the reason that is, is because the pastor is teaching in Korean. So by default, you're probably gonna have Koreans in the church. That's different. They're unified around a common language. They wanna hear the language that's being spoken. But if you have a church that's too black or too white, too Hispanic, too Samoan, too Filipino, too Asian, and it does not reflect the community you're in, you have decided to work, worship culture over Christ. It's culture that's more important than Jesus. Listen, I love culture. I hope you do too. Whether it's your culture or someone else's culture, I love the melting pot that is the church. I am an honorary Mexican, whether you like it or not. They have grafted me into their community, mostly for the food, but at the same time, there is a joy that I have within them. I love the culture. I absolutely love the culture. Part of it is because where I live in San Marcos, literally every single one of my neighbors were Hispanic, and I loved them. It's a great culture. But I don't worship culture over Christ. We can. Guys, this is the problem with, the, again, the world today needs more unity because they put culture over everything. We as the church need to exemplify it. If you look around, this is a melting pot of all sorts of cultures. And let me tell you this, too. When you segregate yourself, put yourself into camps based upon race or by color, what you've done is you've actually been selfish with your culture by not sharing it with the rest of us. I love your culture. I wish your culture, uh, man, let, let's have a taste test of every culture. I'll be there. You name it. Like, I'll, I'll show up. That sounds good. Right? There's so many different cultures and so many different things that you can bring to the table in the melting pot that is the community of Christ. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be known by our love for one another, not the love for a certain preference that we have or a certain color of the skin. The Church of Christ transcends ethnic, nationalistic, and traditional culture. That's who Jesus is. He's a unifier, not a divider. And so the church must be unified, not divided. Again, if you go into any one of those churches and it's predominantly one thing, but it doesn't reflect the culture or the, the community around it, you're in the wrong church. They worship their culture. They don't worship Jesus. So we see this ragtag bunch of guys, these 12 that Jesus brought together, they have this in common, Jesus. 
as I was reading this week, and I'm going to quote it. It's kind of long, but I want you to get it. If you're Christ-oriented and not cause-oriented, you get community and not affinity. If you're cause-oriented, you get affinity. All the people who agree with you will come together. If you're Christ-oriented, people who disagree on a whole lot of things, they will come together. That is actual community. What passes for community in our day is pretty much affinity. Everybody like me hangs out with me and does everything that I like doing. Community is people that are totally unlike me, that don't have much in common with me, that come together with me because of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That's the whole point. It's not about affinity, which is basically feeling that we've got to be in the same group that loves the same thing. Like I said, this is one of the great reasons why we need home fellowships. And not a home fellowship that just does everything that you like doing, but people who are of different backgrounds and have different life experiences because God wants to teach you things. God, God wants to show you that your upbringing isn't the only upbringing that ever was. That there's a lot of things that other people can offer. So we have here at this church a weird, diverse, collective team of all kinds of different people. This isn't the team that I would put together. It's the team that Jesus put together. So we have on our team talented artists and accountants and people who are good with pictures, people who are good with numbers, people who are very vital to the community. I don't get it sometimes. I don't understand how they work. It's one of the things I love. I, I, and again, I may not love it in the moment, but I love it afterwards is people who don't agree with me. Why? Because it gives me another perspective. If everybody agreed with me, I'd only be liking my own perspective. I wouldn't see things sometimes how other people see things. That's why you need people in your life that disagree with you. I've said this many times. If you look in your life and no one ever disagrees with you, you are in a bad way. That is not a great place to be in. Why? Because you're not being challenged on your beliefs. You're not being challenged on the things that you hold dear. You need to have people that will disagree with you and call you to account. So again, he's picking this team, a bunch of weird people, a bunch of no-names, a bunch of nobodies. The best teams are weird teams. I'll just tell you that. We're weird. This church is weird. Just don't, don't look around you, but they're weird. <laughs> they're, weird. they're all weird. Everyone around here, they're just weird. And I'm weird. Why are they weird? Because they're different than me. And the reason that they're weird to you is because they're different than you, right? There's differences. But that's the weird part is what makes it awesome. The weird part is what we can see is how the unification that Christ brings, brings us all together. Yeah. Last point, point number six. When Jesus is the center of the team, you can still have some bad apples. Included in this group was Judas. In fact, there was actually two Judases, but the other guy changed his name to Judas Thaddeus because he didn't want to be lumped in with the other guy. Right? The Judas that did the bad stuff, like, and then there was a guy, like, once he did the bad thing, the other Judas is like, dude, really? Yeah. We have the same name, bro. Like, that was not cool whatsoever. Like, that was really <laughs> terrible of you to do that. So he kind of changed his name to Judas Thaddeus because he didn't want to be that guy. But we have this guy, Judas, the one who betrayed Christ. He was there. He was there for miracles. He was there for walking on water. He was there for water and wine. He was there for the man stretching his hand. I mean, there were so many things. Judas was there to see and witness. We get to read about miracles. Judas was there. He saw them with his own two eyes. But he did what he did. He betrayed the Son of God for 30 pieces of silver. He then hung himself. It, it begs the question, did, G did Judas ever really believe was Judas saved? Like, did he lose his salvation? Like, what happened? To answer this, I want to turn over to Romans chapter 8. If you would, please turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It's an incredibly powerful section of Scripture. But what it tells us, and I'll just kind of preface it, is that there are people who can see all the things that Judas saw, yet still live according to the flesh. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. 
But those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who has ra raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. It's his Spirit in us that causes us to do and to will for his good pleasure. Judas wasn't filled with the Spirit. Judas followed after his flesh. He was a guy that saw everything. And what it, what it scares me for is people who come. They come to church all the time. They do the church thing. They check the boxes. They do the whole Jesus thing. They got even a, a team t-shirt on, if you will. They got a Jesus team shirt on. But they're not doing what God's called them to do. They're not filled with the Spirit. They're following after their flesh. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Because it's not me anymore. Galatians 2.20 tells us, For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's who I am in Christ. Not fulfilling the old flesh, not going after my old man and the old self, but going towards Christ. Again, it says that we will have, when our mind is on the spirit, we will have life and peace. That's what we need, church. It's a conscious decision we must make daily. We'll finish up this chapter, verse 17 of Luke chapter six. And he came down with them and stood at a level place a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him to be healed of their diseases and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured and all the crowd sought to touch him for the power came out of him and he healed them all. So after Jesus chooses this ragtag group of nobodies he goes out and continues ministering and now he's got his team. He goes out and he ministers to the multitudes and you know, it's something is, I was reminded um, a couple of months ago, it was a brother who said, hey, have you ever read this book? And he gave it to me, and I, I was reminded, I was like, oh, that's a book that I remember, I read that in Bible college, and it's called The Master's Plan of Evangelism. And as my heart has been for our church uh, to focus on evangelism and discipleship, I thought, man, I should read this book again. And I read it, and I was instantly reminded of that book again, and I was like, you know what? This is the book for such a time as this. And so I've had the whole staff and the, the, the elders are going through this book together. We're all going through it at the same time. But basically what it does is it gives us the, the, the prescription, if you will, how God did what he did and how we should do what we do. He's casting this wide net. He's teaching to the multitudes. He casts a big net out there because there's a lot of people. There's looky-loos. You know, there's people just kind of checking in. Somebody said something about this guy. Oh, let me go. I'm not doing anything today. Might as well. And they show up. Maybe some of you are here like that. You're like, I don't know, whatever, church or whatever. You know, you show up. You're sitting in the back. Good to see you. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> but you're here, right? That's the big net. Jesus is casting out a wide net. He gives the truth. He shares the truth of the gospel. We'll see next week as he gives this sermon, this beautiful sermon, as we call it in Luke, the Sermon on the Plain. He gives this sermon. And he casts the wide net. But then he's got his guys. He's got his 12. He's got his close Friends, disciples, the guy that he pours into, and then he's got uh, the three or the four, depending on who you're looking at. But he's got Peter, James, John, Andrew. He's got these guys that are really tight, his inner circle, if you will. But again, I want you guys to understand this, and I want you to understand my heart when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to discipleship. Man, I want so I want everyone to be saved. I really do. I, I know there's people that don't want to be saved, and you just say, okay, I love you, uh, but you should be, and you just kind of leave it at that. But I, I want to see everyone saved. Everyone has potential salvation in my book. God, I know, wants to do so much work in that. Yeah, you can clap. That's fine. We want people to say amen. Yeah. Don't want to make that back to happen. But here's what we've got to understand. Jesus didn't call us to make converts. He called us to make disciples. 
And there's a big difference. A disciple is someone, like we said, who's a learner, who wants to learn, who wants to follow Jesus all the days of their life. And one of the distinct characteristics, and I didn't get into it too deep, we'll get into it in a little bit. Not today. And some of you are like, really? For real? <laughs> totally hungry. <laughs> Later, further down the road, weeks from now. Okay. Praise God. Yeah, keep listening. <laughs> but we see that one of the characteristics of a disciple is a disciple makes more disciples. So I'm going to ask you a tough question. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. Do you make disciples? If you say you are a disciple of Christ, but you're not making disciples, I'm not sure. Again, you can be a believer. I don't want you to think like you're in danger of losing your salvation. Yeah, you're going to heaven. Amen. But you're missing out on the fullness that God has for you here. A disciple makes more disciples. A disciple looks at people and says, man, I want them to follow Christ like me. And then you know what they end up doing? Making disciples. Because they saw your example in making them as a disciple. And so they say, as you've told them, go and do likewise. So they then go and make more disciples. That's how it works. That's the whole point. That's why we're here. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Not converts. Anybody can close the deal. Anybody can lead someone in a prayer. But it takes the heart of a disciple, the heart of a disciple to want to disciple someone else. So I, I ask you again, who are you discipling? Maybe that's God's call for you to start getting out there. Maybe there's someone that you need to pour your life into. See how God's going to use them. Jesus poured his life into these 12 guys for three years. And they changed the world. They literally changed eternity because Jesus poured his life into them. You know, as we close and as the worship team comes forward, I've got one more question to ask you. <laughs> I'm going to read this scripture before I ask it. Ephesians chapter 1, starting at verse 3, it says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. My question to you is this, what team are you on? Are you on team Jesus? Are you part of the team that he has chosen? Have you responded to the call? Or are you on team you? See, it's, a, it's an interesting thing when we think about teams. You know, a lot of us, we, we have jerseys in our closet. Just FYI, you're not actually on the team, right? Everybody understands this? Even if you have a Seattle jersey with a number 12 on it, you are still not on the team because you do not have a check. Just FYI. Some of you get that, others do not. But anyway. You got a Mike Trout jersey, you are not Mike Trout. You got a, you know, LaDainian Tomlinson jersey, you are not LaDainian. You can wear the jersey but not be on the team. Some people do that here in Christianity. They wear the Team Jesus jersey. Say, yeah, Team Jesus, but they're not actually on the team. You've seen this before. You see people on the team, on the field, they just stand on the sidelines. They're not actually in the game. Or you see people that are actually on the team, but they just don't do anything. Some of you guys are wearing the jersey, but you don't have, you're not actually on the team. And then still others of you, like I said, you got a U jersey on. You're on Team U. You love yourself. You love yourself, your team. You worship your team. You want more people to be on your team. We got to be careful of that too. Because the Bible basically says if you're on your team, you're dead in your sins. The Bible tells us in Romans also that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, we have this 
great thing that we got passed down from Adam and Eve, and that is sin. Because of the sin of the garden, we're born into this wickedness. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you're on Team U, I want you to understand your sin is upon you. Your sin is owned by you. There's only two people that can pay for your sin. It's either you or Jesus. Because God is a just God. Because he's a just God, he wants to recognize that there's got to be payment for penalty for sin. That payment is separation from him eternally. We call it hell. To be separated because sin separates us from God. But there's this amazing thing because God in his foreknowledge and his wisdom and his grace recognized that he didn't want us to stay there. And so he sent Jesus to die on the cross. And he says that all that should believe in him have come to repentance. And how do they do that? They take off the U jersey and they put it on Jesus. You trade jerseys, basically. All the sin and muck and just nastiness of sin that's on your jersey, you give that to Jesus and it's nailed to the cross. He takes off his jersey, Team Jesus, full of righteousness and grace and puts it on you. He says, you're now clothed in my righteousness. Welcome to Team Jesus. It's forgiveness of sins. It's reconciliation with God. It's done with this world. Father, I thank you so much for this time of just uh, your spirit moving. 